All right, good evening, everybody. It's uh, 7.30 Eastern Standard Time here in Atlanta, Georgia. Welcome to the, uh, uh, let's see, August. Uh, this, <clears throat> this is the August meeting of the Atlanta Radio Club for 2022. Uh, welcome. Let's go ahead and uh, give everybody another two, three minutes to get in here. But uh, if Stephen is available, uh, maybe give us a quick update on anything uh, repeater-wise, if you're around, uh, Stephen. Yep, I'm here. All right, go ahead. So um, we continue to have some noise issues with the repeater, and we are, I'm going to be taking a look at maybe adding a notch filter to the receiver, or not a notch filter, a bandpass filter to curtail some of the noise. It sounds like it may be a mix from various repeaters that are close by. Um, also, we are going to be replacing the controller with an ARCOM RC210 controller and a port expander and an extended I.O. card that will give us four, that will give us five ports so we can have all of the repeaters and the Skywarn link and Echo link, IRLP, whatever we decide to put up there. And I am going to send a list to Aid so he knows what to order from Arcom. I will do that later tonight. And uh, that's basically it. All right, thanks, Stephen. Um, sounds good. Uh, yeah, just get with the aid on that and get all that stuff ordered and let's get rolling with that. So good. Uh, thanks for helping to keep things uh, moving forward uh, and uh, uh, progressing in a positive direction. Uh, thanks, everybody, for being here tonight. Uh, we're Zooming tonight. We've been having some issues with the internet connection down at the Red Cross building. So we decided tonight that we would do our August meeting uh, fully on Zoom again. And uh, hopefully maybe uh, September we can get back to an in-person. You just kind of have to keep an eye out on uh, emails and the website to see what we're doing for September. Um, if we can get everything hooked up and running properly and feel secure about it, then we'll, we'll go back to doing both an in-person with the Zoom. We just had... Uh, quite a few issues the last three months trying to get back to the in-person stuff and making everything work. So stay tuned. And uh, if not, we'll, uh, if we find that we haven't quite cured the issue yet, we'll do another Zoom meeting next month. So um, just stay tuned. If you're not, uh, if you're not getting information on the upcoming events and things like meeting notices, you may not be uh, subscribed to the ARC.io uh, group. You can go to the website and, uh, sign up for that. And of course, we do have a Facebook page where you can find out uh, information on what the club is up to and so forth. So um, if we're good to go, uh, I'm going to hand it over to our dashingly handsome uh, activities manager and program coordinator, Rob O'Satin, KI4UTY for tonight's uh, program. Of course, I'll have to unmute too. OK, yeah. This is kf 4 uty Good evening to the to the net. Um, yeah, so we'll do the. Uh, I guess we'll do the election then afterwards. Uh, actually, we're going to postpone the. Let me do, go over that real quick. We're going to postpone the election to September. Uh, technically, bylaws require that we go through the process of having a uh, publishing and an elections committee. And because we had a difficult time getting somebody to agree to be on the elections committee. Uh, we decided we were just going to, or actually this is more of a unilateral decision on the president's office to postpone that to September. So uh, we do have, uh, I believe I do have a complete slate to run for September now at this point. Uh, and uh, I think I've got a, an election committee in place, but I'm waiting for one confirmation. So if you have a desire to run a slate, contact with me and I'll explain the process to you real quick. You have to put together a slate of officers, which includes all uh, uh, positions, and then make yourself known to the election committee so that they can verify you are in fact a legitimate member of the radio club. And then we can publish it to the club before the next meeting so that we can 
uh, let everybody know who's running uh, for what. And like I said, it's a slate. So literally I've got myself as president and then I've got uh, four other people, I believe, uh, I'm counting right, uh, on the slate for next year's um, office. And slates can have multiple, multiple slates can have some of the same folks. So it's not, uh, it's not necessarily a competition um, to one up somebody. This is just a, an opportunity. If somebody would like to try to do something a different way, then they're more than welcome to run a slate and bring out the different ideas. That's how we make things better. So we're going to postpone that to September and uh, just stay, uh, stay in touch with the uh, website, Facebook, and the email, and we'll uh, hopefully announce here today or tomorrow who the election committee is so that you know who to report to if you desire to run uh, a slate of officers. So uh, no elections tonight. That'll be for September. So now you can have it, Rob. No. Oh. Okay. Now I, I get that. Yeah, it's a challenge because uh, we have to find eight people, right? We have to find five people to run and three for the election committee. <laughs> Sometimes we can't get that many people together. Okay. We have another great program. Um, tonight, as I always say that we have a great program tonight, because we do have a great program uh, every time. And continuing um, continuing why we're going to have another one tonight, and it's going to be on antennas, which is one of my favorite subjects and everyone's favorite subjects, right? Whenever hams get together, they talk about antennas. And I've got someone who's going to tell you all about antennas and uh, take your questions afterwards. And hopefully, uh, you'll have questions. And we'll uh, yeah, we'll learn about a lot of antennas tonight. So the uh, speaker uh, tonight is Eric Webner, W-E-B-N-E-R, K4-F-A-N, K4-FAN. Um, that's me. That's you. So, okay, you, I will turn it over to you then. Take it, Eric. Okay. Well, good, e good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining me. And uh, I promise you, you are not going to learn everything about antennas because, uh, well, how many years do you got, right? <laughs> so um, first off, um, let me see if I'm I got permission to share my screen. Yeah, it looks like we got that. And there we go. So uh, can everybody see my screen? Can everybody yes. hear me yes. okay? Yes. I can hear you. Okay, wonderful. Yes. Well, let's go right ahead then. Um, so again, good evening to everybody. Thank you for joining and welcome to Antennas 101. So this presentation is just a simple overview of antennas commonly used in amateur practice. Um, nothing too crazy. Uh, feel free to take notes and because uh, we're going to have a question and answer period after the at the end of the show. Uh, so grab your popcorn, sit back, relax. I hope to inspire you and uh, maybe we can have some fun. OK, so <clears throat> we're going to talk about a, a few different things here, um, both. Uh, you know, a lot of people, you know, focus on the base antennas, whether it's HF or uh, VHF, UHF. Um, and again, this is a very basic kind of thing. Um, the big question, uh, I don't know how many of you are new hams, but the big question is, hey, I got my license. I got this super whiz bang radio. Okay, now what do I do? This is, a, this is uh, something that's become... Uh, a big, big problem in recent years, I feel, because, you know, you can, a person can get interested in ham radio, uh, study online, take their test, get their license, but they don't really have the mentorship needed so that, okay, hey, this is how you go about putting together a station, and this is how you operate, and so we end up losing a lot of hams uh, because of that. So, a um, couple things that I have on this particular slide. Uh, I don't know if it, you've ever seen a, um, a radiation pattern before, but that's kind of what I've got uh, in the background there. And this is looking down on an antenna that runs from top to bottom. 
and looking at it from above. So this is what they call an azimuth view. If you uh, take a deep dive into antennas and look at um, radiation patterns and performance and all this stuff, you'll also see um, elevation views. This is uh, this is going to be more like you know what angle of radiation do you have above the ground? Um, <clears throat> another important subject of antennas is feed lines, antenna matching circuits, grounding, radials, uh, feed lines. We're, we're not going to talk about that tonight. That could be antennas 102 because uh, they are important things. Um, maybe in a future edition, we'll have some... Uh, some ideas on, on, on how to put up antennas too. But uh, uh, I originally gave this presentation with my, with my friend David uh, back in 2015. It's been uh, updated and revised quite a bit for you guys tonight. Um, so we'll just have to see where all this goes. Okay, so starting out with very simple antennas, um, you know, you buy an HT and it usually comes with, uh, with its own antenna. Uh, if you're HT, whether it's an analog or a digital uh, uh, antenna is gonna have, um, likely nowadays, they're gonna be uh, what's called dual band. So you'll have both two meters and uh, 440 megahertz on it all in one antenna. Uh, sometimes these antennas don't perform really well. Uh, so there's accessory antennas that you can get. Um, at the end of the program, I'll show you one that I have that's a full, well, wait, you guys can see this. So this uh, super flexible thing is, uh, is actually 19 inches. So it's a, it's a quarter wave on uh, two meters. And um, so, and especially if you make it even more like a, a, a ground plane antenna and put what's called a tiger tail on it, uh, you'll get even better performance. So um, next thing. <clears throat> is uh, some of these connectors that, that you'll see used. In the picture here, I've only got the BNC on the left and the male and female versions of the uh, SMA connector. The SMA has become very, very popular for HTs and other small uh, radios. And of course, uh, I have that right here. Now the Chinese radios, they decided they're gonna flip the, uh, just to be proprietary, they're just gonna flip things around. So you may at some point need to get this little thing, which is, it's just a barrel connector so that you can uh, uh, screw into uh, the radio properly. Mm -hmm. um, now, another thing you can do with your HT is you can um, get a little extension cord and then, uh, connect your radio into uh, maybe your mobile antenna that's on the roof of your car, or uh, maybe if you're even using your HD from home, uh, plug it into that antenna that's on the roof. And uh, so there are uh, extension and adapter cables available for that. Um, so for mobile and base use, this is gonna be one of your most basic antennas, just a, uh, a quarter wave ground plane. And if you see at the bottom, uh, they've got dimensions for uh, two meter, uh, uh, 220 and 440. And those are just general um, dimensions there. But uh, this particular one, and you just build it out of, uh, you see on there it says SO239. That's the female connector that's very common. Uh, you probably got that on the back of uh, your HF radio, for instance. So here's some uh, more examples of these uh, mobile uh, VHF, UHF antennas. Um, in the left-hand picture, I had the, uh, the Hustler 5 8 wave. Uh, that was two meters only, but boy, did it perform well. I could hit uh, repeaters that were very far away. Uh, next to it is a typical Larson dual bander. So that'll do the two meter and 440. Uh, operates pretty well. <clears throat> But uh, the best mobile antenna for those bands that I ever had is that Comet dual bander. Uh, it's actually, um, uh, 
it's a what's called a collinear antenna, meaning that there are two or more elements stacked on top of each other um, and then fed so that they're in phase with each other. This increases your radiation and efficiency quite a bit. So <clears throat> another common antenna, and this is probably going to be more of a, a base antenna or portable, is the J-pole uh, vertical antenna. Uh, this is just a half wave radiator uh, that's N fed. And then the part that makes the so called loop of the J is a quarter wavelength uh, stub. And what that does is it allows the 50 ohm impedance of your coax to match with the very high impedance of an N fed half wave antenna. There are dual band versions available. In the right hand picture, you see my friend Richard's uh, collinear. J pole antenna. I don't know if you can see there's a little uh, um, hairpin kind of a thing sticking out to the right. And that's where the first element ends and the next element begins. Now, if you want an easy antenna, is you can you can buy or build a slim gym, a slim gym antenna. This is uh, it's a variation on the J pole antenna, and you just build it out of um, 450 ohm window line. And uh, so one, you could spend uh, 10 or 15 minutes cutting that, hook it up to your radio and off you go. Here's some more uh, collinear antennas. Again, this is base work. Uh, these are you know, like commercially available antennas. Maybe some of you have like the Diamond X50A. That's a, that's a very popular uh, antenna. Uh, in the middle is probably is, is the Ringo Ranger. It's actually the Ringo Ranger 2. Uh, this is an antenna that's been around for a very long time. Uh, really a fantastic design, very well built. Uh, some of these are used in commercial work as well as amateur work. And then uh, probably the Mac Daddy of a, uh, of a base antenna, there would be that uh, folded dipole repeater antenna that you see on the far right. This is, um, this. what this is, is it's four folded dipoles uh, that are phased together in such a way to uh, maximize radiation. Uh, very popular, you guys probably use that on your uh, repeater antennas, I assume. Okay, now to basic, um, antennas that um, you're going to see more on the HF side. Um, and the most basic antenna is the half wavelength horizontal dipole, um, which you see here. Uh, it's it's uh, overall length. You can calculate it by taking 468 divided by the frequency that you want to operate at. So for instance, on uh, seven megahertz, the 40 meter band, your antenna is gonna be 66, 67 feet long, okay? They show it uh, connected with, um, directly with coax because now depending on the height that this antenna is mounted at, you're going to have um, somewhere between 50 and, uh, and 72 ohms uh, input impedance. So it matches up pretty good <coughs> coax. There's also wire antennas uh, that you can buy already pre-made, such as this one, and or you can just make your own. I'm I'm a big fan of making <laughs> my own. So, um, uh, but this particular one, you know, it's it's the the two legs are already cut to length. They've got insulators on them, and it's connected to a what's called a ballon in the middle. Um, <laughs> Balans are highly recommended for these antennas because they uh, these antennas have a balanced feed point. Coaxial cable, which has a signal in the center conductor and uh, essentially ground on the outside, that's an unbalanced feed line. And there's a whole bunch of reasons why um, it's better to go through an, a balan and feed a balanced antenna with a balanced output. So. Here's another way to do the dipole is, is an inverted V antenna. Uh, this can simplify your installation because you only need one center support. Um, the ends can, uh, can droop down. They don't have to be uh, 
exactly linear. Um, but you do want to keep that angle um, no, no less than 90 degrees. Uh, that way you avoid uh, interaction. Uh, the radiation on this is going to be um, pretty omnidirectional, even more so than a horizontal dipole, which is, uh, you know, if you get it up high enough, a horizontal dipole is going to be broadside. The maximum radiation is going to be broadside to the, to the wire. So I mentioned on that repeater antenna that um, those are folded dipoles and folded dipoles are also used in HF work. Uh, they actually used to be used for TV antennas because back in the day, our TVs were the, the, in, the connection between the antenna and the TV was, uh, was a 300 ohm uh, balanced input. And you had that 300 ohm twin lead that you used. So, um, Similarly, with a, with a dipole antenna, if you make it a folded dipole, uh, you can make the whole thing out of twin lead or even that 450 ohm ladder line or window line. You could also use real ladder line too. Um, and those are, uh, now the way they show it here with a, an antenna tuner, uh, this allows this antenna to be used on multiple bands, not just the half wavelength that it's uh, cut for. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit Please. too. Now here we're showing that you don't have to feed an antenna at the center. Uh, you can feed it anywhere along its length, even the end. And certainly the um, right. end fed half wave antenna has gotten very, very popular uh, especially in portable work. Uh, so I don't know if any of you uh, have done summits on the air or uh, parks on the air, uh, commonly known as soda and poda. Um, but uh, those are very popular. It does require a very high ratio uh, ballon to be used, however, because now that we're feeding it at the end, the uh, voltage is going to be really, really high. Uh, same with the impedance. So let's talk a little more about loop antennas. Um, we taught, we, we, I showed you the folded dipole. Well, there's also full wave loop antennas. And, and I did have one of these once, uh, um, and it wasn't that high. It worked really well for short range communication because the radiation tended to be straight up. Now, when you operate this on mm -hmm. higher frequencies, like so like mine was cut for 80 meters, but I, uh, again, using a tuner and, and some other things, I was able to operate it on multiple bands. So by the time you get to say 20 meters, it's starting to radiate more off the ends instead of straight up. And um, so, but a lot of people use that. They really, uh, really like that antenna. And it doesn't have to be horizontal either. You can have a vertically oriented loop antenna. And um, in this case, the radiation is going to be bidirectional. So as you're looking at the, uh, the, as you're looking at the slide, maximum radiation is going to be into the slide and towards your face. And so this, this can make a fairly simple directional antenna. Um, the input impedance on these loop antennas is going to be about 100 ohms. So, um, so you'll probably need uh, some sort of uh, matching for that, too. Another version of it is the delta loop. Um, so it's triangular instead of uh, square. But the nice thing here is you only need one support. And so this is these are fairly popular. In fact, I helped a friend put one up a few years ago. Um, again, it has a balance feed point. So you want to uh, uh, use a ballon in there and you can use one that, you know, say a four to one ballon um, to, to match up to it. Um, antenna tuner would allow you to operate on multiple bands as well. One nice thing about these loops and folded dipoles and so on is that being kind of a closed loop, they are less susceptible to atmospheric noise. So they're quieter. You're not gonna have so much background noise. 
And of course, in the uh, summertime, that's a real big problem. So we're going to switch over and talk about vertical and inverted L antennas. Uh, this is akin to that uh, ground plane antenna that I showed you earlier. But uh, so keep in mind, um, now the very basic one, as I show here, is a quarter wave vertical mono, monopole instead of a dipole. And it needs radials or, uh, or a ground plane depending on how you mount it. And um, so this is gonna have unbalanced feeds. So a direct connection with the coax often works really well. Um, so if you wanted to calculate out real quick a, a quarter wave vertical, the, you'd use 234 divided by the frequency in megahertz. And um, for a ground plane, you're gonna want those radials to be just slightly longer than that length that you calculate for the uh, for the monopole and they they seem to work better in the picture on the right you see where the uh, where the ground plane radials are tilted down and what that actually does it um, it brings the impedance up a little bit a, uh, a vertical antenna will normally be about 38 ohms impedance and by, by drooping the radials at a 45 degree angle, you'll get right around 50 ohms. So makes a good match with your coax. So another version of a vertical antenna is the inverted L. And this antenna has been extremely popular on 160 and 80 meters for many, many years. Um, this, uh, this is just, it, it also, seems to work well for people such as myself who um, I don't have space to put up a, a really tall vertical antenna. So uh, as they show here, you, you go up as high as you can and then you go horizontal the rest of the way. Um, so uh, these also benefit from uh, at least one counterpoise or radial. Um, the one that I used to have uh, when I lived back in Charlotte, North Carolina, um, it, was, it wasn't a quarter wavelength overall because when you, uh, when you, when you double the frequency, uh, you're going to get a very high input impedance. Um, so what a lot of people do is cut it to somewhere in between a quarter and a half wavelength and then... Uh, as you change bands, uh, your, your matching network is, has an easier time of uh, tuning both bands. So <clears throat> anyway, and um, as we'll see later, um, there's actually a lot of uh, antennas out there that are non-resident. You'll see that these antennas don't have to be a half wave or a quarter wave to, uh, to be able to radiate. You just need to be able to have the right methods to match the antenna as a system. System being the antenna, the matching network, the feed line, uh, and everything in between. So another way to do it, instead of a quarter wavelength antenna, is, is a five, five eighths wave element. This gives you higher gain and lower angle of radiation compared to the quarter wave element. Um, and this is kind of gives you a kind of nice advantage, uh, especially for far away repeaters or NHF or uh, DX contacts. Uh, commercially, there are also a lot of uh, multi-band vertical antennas uh, available and they use a lot of different techniques to, uh, and generally what they do is, is they're trying to give you a half wavelength instead of a quarter wavelength on each band so that you don't require the radials. Um, you'll see this one in the picture here. It's got, um, it's got several different counterpoises. Um, those little doodads off to the sides are actually traps and a trap uh, 
will a, tra a trap will block a signal on one frequency, but allow a signal on another frequency. <clears throat> and it's a common technique for uh, for multi-band antennas of many different sorts. Uh, stand by a second. So another multi-band antenna <clears throat> is the fan dipole. And um, one thing to keep in mind, so, so what we have here is half wavelength dipoles for each band. <coughs> Please forgive me, I'm not used to talking this much. Anyway, um, so you can only have four antennas maximum on, a, um, on one of these antennas. Uh, because beyond that, you get too much interaction. Uh, and this was uh, well tested by yours truly when I was originally uh, KA8 FAN, because this was my first antenna in 1979. And I just couldn't get it to work too well. <clears throat> so when I learned about this rule of maximum of four elements, I cut off the 15 meter antenna. And, but I was still able to work on 15 meters because a dipole antenna will resonate not only at its half wave cut for frequency, it'll also do the same thing at three times its frequency. So, and of course the 40 meter uh, antenna, seven megahertz uh, times three, it, it worked on 21 megahertz, 15 meters uh, quite well also. So that was a really, really good antenna for me starting out. Now it didn't have the, uh, what they call the warp bands, you know, 30, 17, 12 meters and so forth, but um, that's okay, we didn't have that back then. Another way to um, use a dipole as a multi-band antenna is to use the off-center fed dipole. And this is based loosely on the Wyndham antenna, which was from the early days of radio. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so instead of fitting in the center where it's going to be 50 ohms, say at say on the lowest frequency, but if you go up to a higher frequency, it's going to be really, really high. And then on other bands, it's going to be somewhere in between. Well, what what you do is you're you're finding a spot, a feed point just off center, um, somewhere about two, somewhere about one third from the left end to where on several different bands, the feed point is about 200 ohms, 200 to 300 ohms. And um, so that's a popular antenna because it makes it easy to, but you're still going to have to have a balance. In this case, we're showing a four to one balance to uh, translate the 50 ohm impedance that the coax and the transmitter wants to see to the uh, 200 or so ohms that the uh, antenna is looking for. Hey, Eric. Yeah. Rob, uh, do you mind? Uh, we're talking about you know impedance and impedance matching and tuners, and I was wondering if you could just take a minute because not everybody may be uh up to that you know just mentioning that you know the, the the radio is looking for something with a certain number you know and and the antennas are going to have varying ones and you're trying to get them together yeah yeah like that good question good question i'm, I'm I, I should have discussed this a little bit before um <clears throat> because it no matter how simple you want to do it there are some uh, technical things that you need to know. So, um, <clears throat> but most most radios are designed to have a 50 ohm impedance on the output, um, and this is just by just by convention. So our coax has a characteristic impedance of 50 ohms. Now impedance includes both a and this is this gets into AC theory a little bit, but it it's a it's a combination of of the resistive component 
as well as any reactants that might be in the system, whether it's caused by a coil or inductor or a capacitor or something along those lines. But antennas have um, impedance characteristics too. And um, so what we're looking to do, it's, it's, it's not always 50 ohm radio, 50 ohm coax, 50 ohm antenna, um, <clears throat> especially as we try to get to um, multi-band antennas. Um, oftentimes you, you need that antenna tuner or a matching network or something like that that will match the antenna as a system so that it operates efficiently because we want efficient radiation so we can get that signal out instead of having uh, losses in heat or losses in uh, radiation that the ground is absorbing and this kind of thing. So um, Rob, does that answer it without getting too technical? Um, let me uh, open it up. Does anybody, does anybody want to hear any more about that or any more detail? Don't be, don't be shy. We're, these are the kind of questions. If you don't, if, if there's someone who doesn't know something, I'll, there are other people who don't know it either, but they're just afraid to ask. So if anybody has any, you know, wants to delve any deeper into this or anything else, please, please speak up. And if you're not sure what to ask, um, jot it down and ask it during the, um, during our question and answer period later on too. But I'm hoping y'all's eyes are not glazing over and I'm trying to go through this quickly too for you. Okay, I'm gonna carry on now. So here's the G5 RV invented by Lewis Varney. And who hasn't heard of a G5 RV antennas? They're all over the place. Um, there's a lot of vendors out there that promise incredible performance, promise that it doesn't need an antenna tuner to operate multiple bands. Um, not really. It's just another version of a non-resonant antenna. And it's using that balanced line uh, in between the coax and the antenna. It's, it's just being used as an impedance transformer. So not my favorite antenna, not a bad antenna, but not, a, I, I think they're overhyped. That's all I'm saying. <clears throat> okay, so this will get, we're going to get it a little bit more into these multi band in, uh, antennas. Um, this is the dipole doublet. And uh, I learned a lot about this uh, from LB Sebek W4RNL. He is one of these guys that just, knew everything about antennas, a brilliant engineer. <clears throat> and I've got a link at the end to, uh, um, if you wanna learn more and take a real deep dive. Anyway, so this antenna is a half wavelength at the lowest operating frequency. Um, and then you feed it with ladder line, window line, um, and use an antenna tuner to match the system, okay? This antenna will work on all bands from that half wave lowest band you cut it for on up to the limits of the antenna tuner. Um, <clears throat> I have a number of times in my life used this very antenna um, and it was cut for 80 meters as my lowest frequency. And using that matching network and the uh, and the uh, the balanced ladder line, I could operate it on many bands. Uh, and you know, just as long as I could turn that antenna tuner to, to get a match, I didn't care about SWR or anything else. Worked great. Another way to do this <clears throat> is to have the broadside doublet. This is an extended double zap, meaning that each leg of the doublet 
is a five eighths wavelength uh, piece. And as we talked about earlier with the uh, with the uh, quarter wave vertical, um, it provides low angle of radiation and, and an even stronger broadside radiation than a regular dipole. Um, <clears throat> the version that I currently use is the 88 foot long one. It actually fits on my tiny little lot. And, uh, and it's an extended double zip on 20 meters. So it's, uh, uh, I mean, it's not, it's, it doesn't give you the radiation of a Yagi or anything, but uh, for my little pistol, uh, 100 watts and a wire, uh, it does quite well. This antenna, uh, obviously you can operate on higher frequencies too with it, uh, and you can operate lower. It's a, about a half wavelength on 60 meters. Uh, it's less than a half wavelength on 80. So when you get when you get to an antenna that's less than a half wavelength, then they become difficult to tune, the impedance gets really low, and the radiation efficiency is not the best. So you do want to keep that in mind. <clears throat> so um, how many of you live in, in, in an HOA or maybe have other reasons that uh, uh, you're not supposed to have an antenna. Uh, well, I learned a long time ago that the old adage uh, really fits this. It's better to ask for forgiveness than it is to ask for permission. So here we have a couple of uh, examples um, in both of them. It's nice that you've got uh, uh, trees to kind of hide, hide your antenna. Um, just makes them, uh, they just don't show up very well. And that keeps the uh, HOA board from sending you letters. And I'm not necessarily encouraging you to do that because I don't wanna be uh, responsible for you getting into trouble. Oops, we went to, missed a slide. So anyway, this is my current setup down here in Orlando, Florida. So on the left-hand picture, looking across the, from across the street, you can barely see a, a little fiberglass mast sticking up there. And if your eyes are better than mine, you might be able to see the antenna wire too. Um, closer look, of course, is on the, uh, the right-hand side. So <clears throat> this is actually my solution to um, not getting letters in the in the mail. Uh, although I should say uh, a, a friend of mine is the vice president and he knows it's there and he doesn't care. So uh, by the way, blue paint on those wires really, really does well for you. And, um, and don't let anybody tell you you have to have a uh, wire of a certain size either. Um, this antenna is insulated 22 gauge uh, alarm wire. And uh, so it's actually uh, quite small. So now let's talk a little bit about uh, directional antennas. <clears throat> First one that became really popular was the Yagi Uda antenna, uh, invented by a couple of uh, PhDs in Japan. In Japan. Uh, unfortunately, because people like to say the shortened name, uh, Dr. Uda doesn't get as much credit as he probably should. Anyway, <clears throat> a Yagi antenna is a dipole in the middle, the driven element. That's what you hook your coax to. Um, and then on either side of it, you have a reflector element on one side that's slightly longer than the driven element. And the director on the other side, which is slightly shorter. And you'll see a lot of antennas where there's more than one director. Um, <clears throat> so, and the maximum signal that you get is gonna be in the direction of those directors. Here's some other uh, examples. Um, so you can have the monoband 
Yagi antenna that'll work on one band. And, um, and as you show, saw in the previous slide, a lot of these uh, contesters and big DXers will get multiple mono band antennas and stack them on top of each other and phase them so that they just get incredible signals out of them. On the other hand, uh, you can use like a tri-band Yagi. So here you can, you can operate more than one band with it. And for many, many years, the tri-bander that operated 20, 15, and 10 was a, a very classic combination. Uh, nowadays, you can get add-on kits, uh, such as on the picture to the right, where he's got a 17 and a 12 meter add-on kit, as well as a 40 meter dipole element. <clears throat> but if you looked very carefully at the OptiBeam on the very first slide, um, there's a lot of these antennas now that'll operate five or six bands even. They're usually monster big things. Speaking of monsters, how about a Yagi antenna for 80 meters? And how about putting it up 120 feet in the air? So this is a friend of mine, uh, uh, he lives in South Carolina. Uh, <clears throat> Monster Array, and I don't even know what went into the mechanical uh, engineering of that, but uh, that was always a very impressive uh, picture for me. So another way to do a multi-band Yagi, maybe you've seen the Step IR antennas, um, turkey vultures not included. Uh, these use motors. There's a motor on each element, which makes this metal, it's essentially like a tape metal, a uh, measuring tape, uh, but it's made out of beryllium. And that motors make them longer or shorter depending on which band you're, you're going to operate on. Um, so that's a very, very clever way to get monoband performance out of, and still have a multi-band antenna. So uh, maybe not everybody has room for a big Yagi and a tower and everything. So next couple slides are some examples of um, more compact antennas. Uh, the Moxon rectangle is probably the, the simplest one, very easy to build and takes up the least amount of room. It's just a folded Yagi. So the, um, the driven element, folds back, the reflector folds back, and they, they don't meet in the middle on the left and right hand side. They're separated a certain distance by an insulator. And, um, you know, this is something you can, you can throw up on a TV rotor on a mast. A, uh, a popular commercial antenna is uh, the hex beam. So this looks like uh, just an upside down umbrella, um, <clears throat> but it's a multi-band antenna. So it's got driven elements for each of the bands it's operating on, as well as multiple reflector elements as well. And um, so that's one way to do, a, do it. The other way to do it is with a spider beam antenna similar in concept, but this has both the driven, the reflector, and it has the director elements, which uh, from which a Reddit user uh, came up with the phrase, spider beam, spider beam, does whatever a hex beam can. But um, <clears throat> So another, uh, loop type antenna is called the quad. Um, it works a lot like the Yagi in that you have a driven element and a reflector. Sometimes you even have directors. But in this case, instead of using a half wave elements, it's using full wave loop elements. I actually own this antenna and unfortunately it's not installed as you see in the picture there. And if anybody wants to buy it, let me know because I just don't have a place to put it anymore.
So another multi-band directional antenna is the log periodic antenna. It uses an array of driven elements, uh, each one progressively longer. And they're all, they're all driven elements. It's not like you have the one, but all of them are driven. And each one is fed 180 degrees out of phase with its neighbor. And um, these antennas can get rather large. So you'll want to get a crane to install one. They don't have quite as much gain as Yagi, but they've got very wide frequency range. And this does not need a, an antenna tuner. <clears throat> Here's one more uh, directional antenna. Uh, these are ground mounted verticals and there's four of them instead of one. It's called a four square antenna. Um, the, if you look carefully in the picture, in the middle of, of, uh, of these four antennas, there's a uh, control box. There's, well, there's a yeah, control box and it's connected to a controller back in the shack. And by operating that, you can change the phase relation relationship of these antennas with relation to each other. And this is what changes what direction uh, your signal is going to go. And unlike a, an antenna on a tower, um, you don't have to wait for that rotor to swing around. You just turn the switch and you, you could be going from northeast to southwest in, uh, in, in a second. So uh, <clears throat> this is part of the antenna farm of uh, another friend of mine back in South Carolina. So what if you want to run, what if you want to operate HF uh, from your car? Well, nice thing is we've uh, got lots of very small multiband radios antenna available or radios available now. Um, and now there's also um, multiband antennas for the, those use. Um, now these short antennas are compromised in performance to the, their full size big brothers but it is possible to get a signal out there. And yes, you can work DX. And uh, I used to do that uh, back when I lived in Charlotte as well. Um, <clears throat> so like uh, the one you see in the picture, the Tar Heel, that's a motorized screwdriver. And what it does is it matches the antenna by adjusting where on that coil, um, uh, it, it makes the match off of. So that's an, one way to do it. <clears throat> There's also ham sticks like you see on the left. Now these are helically wound antennas, at least the bottom half of it. And then you've got the whip up top. And if you want to change bands, you just got to get out of your car, unscrew one antenna, say your 40 meter antenna, and then put your 15 meter ham stick on in place of it. And uh, so those are convenient too. Uh, on the right uh, <clears throat> is the Hustler multi-band mobile where, where you've just got multiple elements uh, made for each band. And uh, so in that case, you don't have to uh, jump out of the car and make changes. So that's Almost the end here. You'll see I've got a kind of a long list of uh, references and this can't possibly be everything that I ever <clears throat> learned about antennas from. Um, there are some good book resources as well as the web. Uh, certainly the ARL handbook has all kinds of information. One of my favorites though is the antenna handbook. And I've gotten newer and newer editions of these uh, since my first one, which was published in 1974. Um, this is a book that would be more appropriate for um, talking about matching and transmission lines and this kind of thing. But uh, the author, um, Walter Maxwell, um, he was he like Sebek was a true true genius and really knew his stuff. Uh, he used to design 
uh, antenna systems for satellites. Now, if you want some ideas on uh, antennas that you can make, how about so one of these um, uh, books? Could be an antenna compendium, wire antenna classics, even more wire antenna classics. And if you're in a HOA, maybe you want to want this one. This will help you with uh, small antennas in small spaces. So, and not everything that I ever had came only from the ARRL. Um, there's been lots of other uh, books and stuff along the way too. A lot of good information. So with that, questions and answers. And if you guys are a little shy about asking questions, I got a few questions for you. Um, maybe you can uh, let me know what bands and modes do you currently use? Or what ones are you interested in that you haven't tried? What kinds of antennas do you have? You wanna just buy an antenna and put it up or do you wanna make your own antenna? Uh, there are some other antennas we didn't talk about that maybe you're familiar with, magnetic loops and uh, parabolic dish antennas, which you'll see more on the microwave frequencies. Um, and there's also lots of uh, computer programs out there for designing antennas and calculating antenna performance, such as the um, uh, Easy Neck. I've actually shamefully haven't learned how to use that yet, but it's on my to-do list. So I invite you to do your own exploring, whether on the web or any of these books that I showed you. Um, and I encourage your questions now. I have a question about uh, the off-center fed. Uh, it showed insulated wire. Any particular reason of having the wire insulated? Uh, no. No, it... Um, or is it just convenience? It's easier to buy it. It's it probably due to convenience. So um, most designs you'll see, and, and, and most of the time when you buy an antenna, uh, it's it's going to be bare wire, um, but like even when I was showing my 88 foot uh, doublet, um, that was just made out of a material I had convenient. So since I work in the security electronics industry, <clears throat> it was uh, very convenient for me to uh, strip out uh, some 22 gauge wire from a box of cable that I have. Um, the, the insulation won't affect the wire's ability to radiate. Uh, it does change what's called the velocity factor a little bit. In other words, um, <clears throat> um, you probably know that in a vacuum, electromagnetic radiation, whether it's RF or visible light or X-rays travels at uh, the speed of light. Um, and right now that number is escaping me and it shouldn't, but oh well. 86,000 miles per second. There it is, thank you, I appreciate that. So um, in the atmosphere, it's slightly slower and on an antenna or in a transmission line, it's gonna be even slower. So between the bare wire and, and the uh, insulated wire, the insulated wire, it's gonna be a little bit slower. So you may have, when you put up an antenna with that, you if you're putting up a resonant antenna like a dipole, say cut for 20 meters, for instance, it might end up being a little bit shorter uh, when you're done trimming it than it would be if it was bare wire. See, I was thinking if you're running 160 or 80 about the additional weight that um, the insulated wire would have. Yeah, uh, mechanically, especially for the bigger wires, that, that would be a concern. Um, 
and certainly it's it's a little bit of it was a little bit of concern when I put this my current antenna up because well the in you know with that insulation the wire is a little bit thicker and possibly a little easier to see. Uh, it wasn't quite like uh, the first um, the first multi-band uh, doublet antenna I ever put up was when I was living in an apartment um, on the third floor <clears throat> and I needed to get something out the window so that I could listen to W1AW and, uh, and be able to uh, 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 get my code speed up so I could pass my extra class license uh, years ago, back when CW was still required. 20 words per minute. Yes. I ended up making that antenna. It was started as just a wire thrown out the window and grew into uh, this antenna. It was a half wavelength on 80 meters, and I fed it with twin lead and had, a, had an antenna tuner sitting on top of my uh, TS520 radio. Um, it was number 30 magnet wire. Really? So you could not see it. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, if you had an ice storm like we did in Columbus, Ohio, a few times, the antenna would build up with ice. It would break. It would come down. I have to go go repair it and haul it back up again. I would think that number thirty, just pulling on the wire, trying to get it up in the air, you could break it. Probably had to be. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 fragile. I had to be careful with it. Um, certainly the, the ends where I hung it from were, you know, they weren't heavy weights by any stretch. Uh, in fact, uh, what, all I did was just, um, uh, the wire leg and then, uh, monofilament fishing line and a little, I think it was a one ounce fishing weight, uh, holding the tension on it. Now with uh, 30 gauge, did you have any problems with bandwidth? No. See, that's the nice thing about a multi-band antenna using a, a, a uh, antenna tuner is that you're not too concerned about bandwidth. Um, and I actually found absolutely no problems in terms of uh, bandwidth on that. Um, again, though, back, back at that time, I didn't have I didn't have a fat wire antenna to compare it against. So um, maybe that's just uh, conjecture on my part. Question, Eric. Um, in the hex beam, have you seen any uh, modeling for that? What do the patterns look like since the uh, elements are so close together? Um, no, I haven't seen any. Um, unfortunately, I haven't, haven't really had a chance to get into those too much. Um, but um, certainly any of those folded Yagi antennas is going to be a bit of a compromise in terms of performance. Um, and so, so you may not have as good of uh, what's called front to uh gain and uh, they also talk about these directional antennas in terms of front to back ratio. In other words, how big is the signal compared to coming off the backside? Um, they also talk about front to side ratio because yeah, you do get a little, little bit of radiation off the sides. So I suspect that with hex beam, spider beam, et cetera, that, um, those specifications, I guess, those, those uh, performance measures won't be quite as good as with a full-size monoband Yagi antenna. Do you know if you can model it with EasyNeck? I expect there, so with EasyNeck, yeah, I'll, I'll bet there's already a modeling file out there for it. So if you've done anything with uh, EasyNeck, um, and again, I, I I claim severe ignorance on this, but there is um, I know there's all kinds of files out there for various antenna uh, configurations. 
So hopefully you could find it yourself without having to create it on your own. Have you have you done anything with uh, Easy Neck yourself? No, no, I, I've used the antenna and I'm very happy with it, but uh, I'm curious what the uh, sides look like. Front to back is not bad. Front gain isn't bad, but I have no idea what the sides look like. Mm-hmm. Well, that'd be very interesting to see that or to see if um, um, that you, you bought or built this X-Beam. See if I, yeah. Uh, no, I bought it and uh, it's been up about six months, maybe. Okay, fantastic. Haven't tested it against any big storms yet, have you? That's the reason I have the uh, X-Beam. <laughs> because the tribander didn't like the trees. Ah, yes. <clears throat> yeah, well, that's probably why I can't hardly put anything up because I've got a lot of trees directly behind me. Uh, so yeah, there's not a lot of space. Well, I hope that antenna works well for you. Um, and, and you might look to see uh, on the manufacturer's website, they, they will often have um, uh, example radiation patterns that you can look at. So, Eric, are you looking at the uh, chat? There, because there are some things in the chat. No, I'm not looking at the chat. The chat on the bottom. Um, I'm going to stop sharing, and maybe I can look at questions on the chat here. Okay, so uh, let me make sure I'm all the way up to the top too. Yeah, there aren't that many. Yeah, okay. All right, so Skip asks, um, he says he uses a uh, NFED halfway for POTA and SODA. Um, you've also been thinking about carrying a random wire with a small tuner. Uh, yes, that's, you, you could do that as well. Um, I've seen where, um, yeah, you can just basically uh, hook that to a small tuner and uh, hang it as a sloper um, and use the matching network to uh, do that. But I'd kind of think too that the NFED half wave that you have probably already is kind of that same setup. So have you ever tried that antenna with just putting a matching network on it to see if, if you can operate multiple bands that way? Well, the, the ones I've been using, you know, are the standard 10, 15, 20, 40. Mm -hmm. And it's got that uh, 49 to 1 on, on, on it. Yes. On it. On, 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 on it. Whatever. I can't say that. But the um, <laughs> um, what I was um, thinking about was if I um, had a random wire, and I, I'm still trying to figure out what length to use because that gets confusing to me but the with maybe a nine to one and a tuner i could switch around bands a little bit easier like right now if i want to switch to 30 i've got to pull one and fed half wave down and put up another one mm -hmm. and I was, th I was thinking maybe a, a random wire would make it a little bit easier to switch bands but i haven't used one i was just curious if you had any thoughts right right uh, yeah maybe um and this is something certainly you could just experiment with. Um, um, is is say for instance is is thirty going to be the lowest band that you use? No, I mean I. Well, I haven't Maybe really. Forty would be useful too. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I, like I said, I mean mostly it's been you know ten, fifteen, twenty, forty, and then. Uh, from time to time, I've pulled that down and thrown up a 30 meter and mm -hmm. fed halfway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but that's all I've done so far. Yeah. So I'd, I'd say imagine it um, sort of like that inverted L that I was talking about earlier, except except that maybe, you know, it's, it's a sloper and not a vertical and a horizontal piece. Is, um, and um, I think the first thing you might want to try would be to try and cut it for uh, three eighths of a wavelength 
at the um, lowest frequency you're going to operate. And um, so obviously that's going to be right somewhere in between. And again, it just it doesn't have to be exact, just approximately uh, halfway between the length you'd use if it was a quarter wave and the length you'd use if it was a half wave. Uh, cut it to that length, hang it, uh, connect it to your tuner, um, put a counterpoise out there as well, and see what you can do with that. I think you'd have a lot of fun. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Good question. Uh, Pat just made a comment about zip cord antennas. Uh, yes, you can make antennas out of zip cord. Um, just get a long, long, long piece and um, have part of it that's, that is your transmission line. And the other part, the part that you pull apart is going to end up being your, your dipole antenna. And uh, so I've seen, uh, I've seen people do that as well. It doesn't have to be an official twin lead, ladder line, window line uh, type of cord for the transmission line. Uh, does Pat, do you have any more comments on that or questions? I've got a question about you were talking about earlier about painting your uh, antenna blue. Yes. Do you have any tips about what sort of paint to uh, to use? Maybe if I can figure out where to find it, I have a I have I have a picture of that blue somewhere. Ah, no, I can't find that. I'm sorry. Um, I just went to the hardware store. I picked out a nice uh, Carolina blue uh, Krylon spray paint. And that's, that's what I used for that. Just, just non-metallic. Yeah, yeah. You wouldn't you want to use uh, any of the metallic paints. If for no other reason than the fact that it would it would uh, shine quite a bit uh, and not be very stealthy. And if if you paint it, you got to paint it before you put it up, right? Because that's going to affect the velocity factor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Picture that I I couldn't find it was that uh, doublet antenna of mine painted blue before I put it up on that mast. So uh, unfortunately, I couldn't. I had a couple of minutes to look around, I could find it, but I don't want to take too much of your time this evening. Um, so the OCF, uh, one, here's a question. Can the off-center fed antenna have additional legs? In other words, can it be off-center fed? And then can it have multiple elements? Yes, you could do that. Um, I don't know if you would maybe maybe get better matching from one antenna to another. I'm 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 not sure. I've um, that's an interesting question though. Um, for center fed antennas, and um, I think it was brought. This is going off on a little bit of a tangent, but. Um, <clears throat> We were talking earlier about my 30 gauge antenna wire and if there were bandwidth limitations because of that skinny wire. Um, I know another since uh, 80 meters is a difficult band to cover the entire band with an, with a, uh, a single antenna. I have seen fan dipoles where one is cut for 75 meters, the upper end of 80 meters and the other one is cut for the lower end of 80 meters and uh, yep. that seems to work well also. Okay, Pat has another question um, about velocity factor to shorten the physical length. Uh, Pat, can you give me a little more detail about where you're going with this? Or was it a comment instead of a question?
Okay, maybe Pat can jump back in there. He says it's just a comment. Okay. Okay. But um, <clears throat> is that, yeah, it, it is, it is absolutely correct. Um, some for antennas, such as if I were cutting a dipole for, uh, for a particular band using bare wire versus insulated wire, there, there might be a slight change in the calculation, but usually you just figure that out when you adjust uh, or, or trim the length of the uh, legs of the antenna. Um, on the other hand, velocity factor is very important uh, when you start talking about transmission lines. And so if you're using a transmission line as an impedance transformer, um, you're, you're, you're gonna cut it to a certain length and that velocity factor, which you might see in the specifications of coax or ladder line or whatever, that becomes a factor in the calculations. Um, Jay asked or made a comment, uh, yeah, you can model the hex beam antenna. Um, Jay, do you know if there's already neck files out there? Push the space bar down to talk. There he is. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, I'll put out a couple of uh, underneath that one. Uh, if you look uh, down lower, there's a couple of places where you can see the uh, radiation patterns for some hex beams. Oh, okay. Yeah, and, and I, I was on that K4KIO website. A K4 KIO only had the 20 meter, but on down, uh, KG4, J, JH has uh, several of them on his. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Um, I, I don't see that. I don't see the, the second. Yeah, I don't see the second one either. The last one I just sent is the one that has uh, most of them, but uh, radiation patterns for 20 hex can be found at the K4KIO site. Okay, very good. Let me, um, let me back up just a little bit. Uh, Ed asks if hamsticks can be used with an antenna tuner. Um, apparently, Ed, you've, you're, you're trying to figure out antennas for a, uh, situation in a condominium no they're two separate questions the first okay. one is if you put a ham ham stick on a car do you tune the thing or do you just screw it in and hope for the best no you just screw it in and you know so so if you screw in your 40 meter ham stick into your uh mobile antenna mount you're going to operate on 40 meters um i i have I've, I've not heard of anybody using an antenna tuner to operated on different bands and you may end up with a situation where um, where it might not tune well, you wouldn't have uh, good radiation. So it's probably easier just to get out of your car, take your 40 meter ham stick off and put your 20 meter ham stick on in place of it. Yeah, my question was more, uh, if you use the 40 meter ham stick, can you assume it's tuned or do you need to fine tune it? So. The, uh, the, the whip, the, the top section of it, um has a little set screw so that you can adjust the length um got it okay once that's you, how you tune it yeah yeah so so once you've tuned it for minimum swr at whatever part of the band you want then uh you're just off and running so okay. again being a compromise antenna this uh you're not gonna you know like like if you had a um Quarter a full quarter wave vertical at your house on say 40 meters, you're probably going to be able to cover the whole band uh, before the SWR gets gets too obnoxious. Um, with a ham stick, you're not going to cover as much. Okay. And, so, and then my second question is um, my situation is I live on the fifth floor of a condo. Mm -hmm. I do have a back porch. 
Uh, the antenna that I use is called a super antenna. I use that one because it's also the one I use out in the field when I'm going portable. It okay. seems to work pretty well on 20 meters. I can't get it to work very well on 40 meters. I have It has four radials, and I just put the radials wherever I can find space for them. Do you okay. have any recommendations for, for using that antenna in a condo on the back porch? What uh, I, I'm not familiar with the super antenna. Can you describe how it's put together? Uh, well, it's got a, uh, or better yet, it's sitting right here. Let me bring it over here and put it in front of the camera. Okay. We'll take a look at that in just a minute. Just a quick note before everybody runs off tonight, uh, at the end of the presentation here, our uh, door prize for the night is the uh, second edition of small antennas, small spaces. It was something that uh, Eric mentioned. I think Eric had the first edition, but this is the uh, part of the most up to date. So we'll be drawn for that. I know, it's okay. just got a blue cover. Yeah, so you got one, different coils. Got second edition. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. You got okay. different coils for nice. um, this one is for 40 and uh, 20 meters. But a different coil is for 80, and I don't ever use 80 here. And then you got a different coil for uh, 17, I think. But anyway, you 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 put an antenna tuner on it, and then you adjust it up and down to get it tuned. And I don't have any problem getting it tuned, but there's also in the base. Um, In the base, you got a place where four radials go. Okay. Get right here. You plug connector in here, and then you have four radials that go out from here. Okay. And so it, it works very well, portable, out in the field. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess my question is, how, how can I use it better in my condo? Again, I have a back porch. And right now, I just put the radials wherever I can get them. Okay. So if you stick it on the back porch, it's going to be fairly clear of, like, you don't have a roof over your porch or anything like that? I, I do, but if I put it out at the edge, it, it yeah. gets out towards the west and the north and the south. Oh, nice, well. nice. Okay. Yeah. Maybe, um, I don't know if you attach wire for the radials, but um, certainly for 40 meters, I think you'd want to make those uh, fairly long. Yeah, well, they're pre-cut. They, they come with the antenna. Okay. The manufacturer cuts them to size. Yeah, so you'd probably have to run at least one of them kind of in into your condo and around the house. Yeah, they're all over the place. Yeah, yeah, okay. And I've heard of people doing that with indoor antennas or near indoor antennas like what you have and just... Um, staple uh the radio wires along the baseboards throughout the house or maybe under the carpet if you if you have carpeting well i don't i don't make them permanent because you know the next day i might throw them in a car and go to a park somewhere yeah yeah so maybe you'd have to have an extra set one for at home and one for taking in the car but uh yeah i hope that antenna works out well for you it looks uh looks pretty good do you have any suggestions for radials? You know, where should I put the radials? Or, or just wherever? It's, it's, it's really more of a, you know, just try whatever. Um, the radials are ideally going to be horizontal, but as I, as I showed earlier, you can certainly have radials that, that droop down. Um, so being on the fifth floor, um, I don't yeah, know if there's not ideal. <laughs> you can attach to on the outside of the building, perhaps, or I I can do it for at night, and then I gotta pull them in before yeah. the sun comes up. Yeah. We're not we're not officially supposed to have antennas on the building. Exactly. But, <laughs> but well, they don't know what happens at night here. Exactly. <laughs> Well, maybe you just need some of that 30 gauge and uh, magnet wire that I used many years ago and uh, uh, just string that out the uh, and maybe there's maybe there's some some trees out there or something 
you could attach it to and it wouldn't yeah. be seen so all right well thank you that's a that's an idea um yeah i gotta let me bring the chat over to another window here so maybe i can see it better um I'm looking question. at some more comments too. A question. Do you get better bandwidth off the 12 string or the six string? And I assume um, the electric has the highest velocity factor. <laughs> Indeed it does. <laughs> Indeed it does. Yeah. No, I haven't tried to load those up yet, but uh, you know, maybe uh, I don't know. Well, good comment though. <laughs> Uh, got some more comments about ham sticks working really well. Um, David worked Western Canada. What, what band was that on David? If David's still in there. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was on 20 meters. Okay, very good, yeah. Yeah, I was absolutely amazed when it worked. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah last, last time I ran mobile was on a, uh, um, again, this is when I lived in Charlotte, <clears throat> and I, uh, I drove a service van, you know, big e Ford E250, and I, uh, I just put a, one of those, um, and uh antenna base clips on the one of the rear doors and um i used ham sticks for a while and yeah i worked some dx with that and uh later on i don't know if you've ever seen those wolf river coils i meant i, I should have had a picture of that uh this is a manually adjustable coil um so it's the it, it's the cheap hams um uh Tar heel antenna, essentially, but I had to figure out where where along that coil it's going to match up on each band and adjust it manually. So I have one of those things and it works well, very well. Yeah, I'm really pleased with it. I yeah. it's and I, and I keep seeing them at ham fest, especially the bigger ham fest, uh, Wolf River coils, and they they've come out with all kinds of. Uh, uh, stuff to go with it, uh, some nice portable antennas and stuff like that. So uh, they're great. I, I like them. Yeah, good stuff there. Good stuff. Okay. Ah, yet one more um, good comment from Pat is about the SGC stealth antennas on their website. Um, I actually, I actually have used the SGC um, uh, 231 uh, remote antenna tuner. Um, SGC doesn't seem to be as popular or well-known in amateur radio as um, like MFJ and, and um, LG Electronics. I think they both have uh, remote automatic antenna tuners. But I got this uh, SGC unit a number of years ago. And that's what I've used on the last two uh, multi-band doublet antennas. Um, right now, I've got coax running up to the attic. It's just a one-story house, as you saw in the picture. And then the automatic antenna tuner is mounted up in the attic. Uh, there's a ballon right after it, and then I go to the, um, the 300 ohm uh, twin lead to uh, get outside to where the antenna is on the mast. And that setup's uh, working really, really well for me. And by using an automatic antenna tuner, uh, not that I'm a big contester, but um, it makes me what they call frequency agile. In other words, uh, if I'm, if I'm doing field day or trying to do a DX contest and I, 
I'm on 40 meters, but I see a spot on 15. Um, it's, it's about it's about three seconds to uh, fully do the band change. And uh, so there's a lot of a lot of really cool things that um, uh, that we can do nowadays um, with antennas and changing bands and logging and all that stuff. So, but uh, anyway, so um, does anybody else have questions or comments that they want to make? I've got I've got one, Rob. Um... Yeah, I'm trying to find a multiband antenna. And one thing that I was looking at was uh, it was an MFJ spider where it was a um, you hooked up you hooked up eight hamsticks to it in a dipole fashion. So you'd have you know two on one frequency, you know four pairs of of two. Yeah, gives you four different bands, and then it, you know it's connected to one connector and and. Um, and you run that, and I was gonna—I was looking at getting that until <laughs> I started reading about tuning, and they, and you know, just with all those little set screws, and and <laughs> it's, it, it seemed like it's 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 a, it would be a pain to tune. I know yeah. you only do it once, but um, okay. I think Rob, what you're talking about is the, um, uh, I think MFJ calls it the octo antenna. Is that correct? Yeah, that may be. Yeah, that may be. That may be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's eight. It's got eight connections on it. Uh, you know, eight, um, right. So basically, eight basically, yeah. that's like the fan dipole that I showed you. And so you're limited to only four, um, but they're using ham sticks or buddy poles or something like that. Um, well, the actual element would be each one half of a dipole, essentially, and then each pair is for a different, you know, different band. So, uh, but yeah, any fan dipole like the wire one I made many years ago, or the or the uh, the octo antenna, um, there's always going to be some interaction. So, uh, you you do have to take the time to, uh, in the case of what you're looking at, adjust the uh, adjust the whips on on each set of uh, antennas. It's sort of like these uh, guitars uh, that somebody mentioned earlier. You know, when you when you tune a guitar, um, especially if you're just putting on a fresh set of strings, you you tune it one string at a time, and then after you've got all this tension build up, it screws up the tuning of every of, of all the uh, strings that you've already done. So you go back and do it again, and then check it a third time to make sure everything is. Uh, all happy. Um, it's kind of the same thing with uh, tuning these uh, fan dipoles. Yeah, that, it just sounds like on the hamstick, it sounds like a pain because you adjust the length on one side and you get the SWR you like, but then you then you go to the other side, and I guess you're going to adjust the other one the same the same way, and then and then your SWR goes back off again. <laughs> yeah, well, you you would want to adjust them in pairs. You know, so do the two for, for say 40 meters. Yeah. Do the two for 20 and so on and so forth. Um, and I'm trying to remember, I remember reading somewhere that with with a dipole or vertical or whatever antenna, that there's there's a technique. I think what you do, so like like um Maybe for example, just a simple wire half wave dipole. Um, you calculate the length that you want, and then you cut your wire longer than you need, but fold it at that point. Put it up, check the SWR, and then and, and check it across the band and where you see you have the, the lowest SWR. Maybe it's at 7.2 megahertz instead of 7.1, you can then reverse your 468 divided by frequency um, calculation and find out what that new constant number is. It won't be 468, maybe it'll be uh, 480 
and then redo that calculation, 480 divided by 7.1. And then that length will get you awful darn close to what you wanted to do. So that way you're not left all day trying to figure out, um, you know, trim a little here, trim a little there and back and forth. So um, that's kind of hard to d just describe like this, but um, no, I, I get, I, I get that. The, uh, yeah, I don't know that you'd be able to apply that to a hamstick uh, type antenna, though. I'll let you know if I do it. <laughs> yeah, let me know. I'd be very interested, and and I'm sure the instructions have probably have some hints on maybe how much to add or take away at a time. Yeah, they. Um, in fact, they were recommending throwing throwing a rotor on there too. Um, oh yeah. Okay. If I spin it real fast, it can, it could you know, it can blow some wind. But <laughs> take a fan out of the fan dipole. There you go. There you go. Okay, guys. Well, uh, we made it past nine o'clock, and uh, I don't see anybody's eyes glazed over. But um, unless you have any other questions, I think I've uh, covered about everything that I know, and I certainly do not know all there is to know about antennas. But I hope you've enjoyed this. Um, I'd appreciate your feedback and um, or any comments. Um, and I'm good on QRZ if you want to drop me an email later or have any suggestions on how uh, what I should do for my next presentation or how to make this presentation uh, better for the next group that that uh, asks me to do it. Yeah, let us know when you have it. I will. <laughs> when, you, when you do the antennas uh, 102. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Okay. Uh, Eric, thank you. Thank you okay. very much. Okay. Gentlemen, it. have a really good night, and it's been a pleasure, and uh, we'll see you down the log. See you on the air. <laughs> We're on the air. That'd be even better. Thank you. Great presentation. Right, Eric. Thank you very much, Eric. All right, let's real quick. It's getting late. I'm going to draw. I've taken the names out of the people yes. that left. So you're, the odds of us finding a winner here are really good. So let's see who's got the second edition of the small antenna uh, chip. The chip leave too quickly? Chip KM4AF. Oh, you boy. have to be present to win? Well, yeah, we try to. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so Chip must have cut out in the last couple of minutes because I tried to take the names out of people at the art. So we'll go another name here. All right, so Jerome. Jerome, are you still with us? Uh, WD4CWG. Oh, yep. Jerome is still with us. Congratulations, Jerome. I've got a, I don't know if you heard it, but we've got the uh, second edition of the small antennas, small spaces, uh, ARRL manual that we're going to sent to us tonight's door prize, so congratulations. He's here, he's just, cat's got his tongue. So congratulations, Jerome. That's a I'm, good a, I'm gonna assume your, your uh, QRZ is correct. I'll double check and try to email you ahead of time before I email it, before I mail this off to you, so. Congrats, Jerome. Thanks again, Eric, uh, another great, uh, we always, this group always seems to look forward to the uh, antenna um form so that was uh everybody was really looking forward to this one tonight and i think they got what they were looking forward to so thank you very much good good i was very happy to do that now we're looking forward to 102 like, yeah like we're looking for there. 102 that's right <laughs> <laughs> didn't they do that with star wars when when one of them came out said okay that's great when's the next one so yeah, yeah. that that this presentation is great when's the next one I think they're on the eighth okay. one now from Star Trek. So. We'll see. Yeah, you got. Yeah, well, yeah. after I did the first one, uh, when I was with the Mecklenburg Amateur Radio Society, um, um, yeah, there was talk about, gee, what, are, you know, where do we go with this one? And um, my first thought was to uh, talk about some antenna construction techniques, um, of which I think I know quite a bit in terms of wire antennas, but uh, commercial antennas and especially Yagi's and stuff like that. Um, uh, I probably don't know anywhere near what I should know about. Um, and then the other thing is, is uh, gee, maybe we need to talk about 
um, transmission lines and matching and oh my gosh, how do we make that simple? Yeah, that's all. <laughs> that's going to be a big challenge. <laughs> well, to help people on the extra test. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Eric. Seven three. And, uh, just a real quick. I noticed. Uh, just a real quick welcome. We uh, looks like we picked up an Aussie from uh, uh, just south of Sydney with us tonight uh, on Zoom. So, Fred uh, VK two WS, welcome. Yeah, I'm here. I came in. Uh, it's uh, early in the morning here. It, oh, sorry, it's eleven thirteen a.m. So yeah, I've been out with the guys for a coffee, discussing a lot of ham issues. I came home and I thought, oh, I'll see if I can get onto the Zoom. So I caught the tail end of it. But anyway, all good. Okay. Well, yeah, thank you. Ahead. We're going to put it it'll be on YouTube if you want to see the whole thing. Okay. Yep. Yeah. I see recording. it's recorded. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah, it'll be on a, on the ARC, the Atlanta Radio Club uh, YouTube channel. Yeah. I'm a member of Gwinnett Amateur Radio Society. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I travel over there often and I'll be there in September. Oh, okay. All right. Well, we. Well, you got to come by yeah. and see us then. Yeah. Yeah. So, this is the first time with this one. Anyway, good. All right. Well, welcome. Well, good Thank talk. Thank you for joining us. No problem. Thank you. All right. Uh, I don't have anything else. Uh, it is kind of late. Uh, like I said, we kind of postponed elections until September's meeting. Uh, we do have the Huntsville Ham Fest coming up in a couple of weeks. I think it's the 20th, uh, Saturday and Sunday. Uh, so if you've never been to that one, certainly if you're in the Atlanta area, it's only about a, well, I don't know, two and a half hour trip over. It's fairly scenic and uh, that's a fun trip. It's a worthwhile trip. So um uh, I know a lot of folks meet up on the mountain uh, uh, north or let's see northeast of Huntsville I guess sand something I'm drawing a blank now uh, a lot of soda goes on up there and um, but uh, hotels are usually fairly easy to come by there also there's Airbnb and uh, I highly uh, recommend uh, checking that ham fest out coming up here in the next couple of weeks see you all uh, see you all at uh, Huntsville it's about an hour's drive for me yeah, so yeah, look for us. There'll be the, the Atlanta Ham Fest uh, table will be out there, so you can certainly find a couple of us at that table. Um, and I believe they've added some more flea market tables this week, so apparently they're doing doing fairly well, uh, which is good to see. We had a rough we had a rough go of it in July or June for our event, but it uh, uh, looks like with gas prices slackening off a little bit, people are a little more willing to make those trips. So do give them a shot and and support that so it's always always great to support a fairly local ham fest so uh, and that one's definitely uh well worth going making the trip for you won't be that's like the next biggest one after orlando right uh um no well you got hamvention of course but well i mean uh, well i mean yeah i mean dayton's one and, and orlando's two yeah. and yeah and then number three in, in, well, maybe, uh, maybe in the maybe scale three. of things is, yeah. is huntsville and it's an all indoor ham fest so if it's raining or hot that won't be a problem because you'll be indoors with the air conditioning so all right uh we have two board members left do y'all have anything uh aid or, or rob any comments how about next month's program do we have a, a program set yet rob yeah antennas 102 no okay <laughs> oh no not yet it'll okay. happen It'll so stay too. tuned on that. No, we usually put that on the web page, Facebook. Yeah, I was waiting for the election. If I didn't get reelected, then I was going to let the other program manager worry about it. Oh no, you're you're you're, you're oh, stuck. Okay. You can't go anywhere. I, I can't, get out, <laughs> can't get out of it. Uh, we have lunch tomorrow, twelve thirty, Miller Mushroom in Brookhaven. Uh, yeah, do join us for that weekly, too. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, weekly lunch. So, thanks everyone. All right. Well, y'all, uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, great to see you, Fred. And thanks, Eric, uh, for a great presentation. And uh, join us again uh, next month. Uh, even if you're not in town, you can still join us through Zoom. So please do join us. And uh, we should have another great presentation. Rob's done a great job putting things together every yeah, year. Yeah, I'll send Eric, I'll send you the YouTube link when it gets up there. So you'll have that. Appreciate it, Eric. And like Eric said, if you have any comments or suggestions for him, let him know. Hit him up on QRZ and let him know. All right. All right, guys. Everybody have a good evening. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night.